greetings everybody from from the academy it really is a huge honor to um go from off the, um, the, the the series of lectures that we have uh, arranged uh, for the academy fellows i mean i i'd, uh, I'd like to, to to congratulate uh carlos and mia in particular who've, who've been coordinating this the title of this talk is a little bit of an indulgence in some ways I, I, i've given myself the kind of the advantage of being able to um set the scene if you like for the series of webinars that we're going to have over the next sort of year or so um clearly the the, the topics that other people uh, are presenting on are, are you know reasonably specific around certain areas maybe be disease modeling or statistics or ethics what have you um and as the first speaker i, I felt there was a an opportunity for me to do a little bit of a contextual um you know presentation over where I see we are at in terms of the research uh, currently I made a little bit of forward thinking to where we could be in about um, 20 years in, a, in about five or ten years time um, these are my sort of personal perspective on and some of them might be a little bit controversial they might be a little bit um, challenging but um, I'm going to make the point that I actually think the term and the concept of dementia will actually soon be extinct um, and I'll hopefully justify that. Um, this will, I think, create for us some challenges over the next few years as we look to change the language, change the description, change the clinical conceptualization of neurodegenerative disease, which my personal view is can't really accommodate this concept of, of dementia uh, for much longer, to be honest. The second point, um, in, in when I sort of look into the crystal ball, is that more and more the research environment for dementia, and you know, one can discuss or debate whether or not this is a good thing, uh, will be dominated by a series of major initiatives, you know, huge funding uh, programs of research um, that I've, I've, I've put here will have a huge gravitational pull. And I'll explain what I mean by that later. But again, there's a sense that, or is there the sense of whether or not these, these are good things or whether or not these are challenging things for the research environment in terms of moving knowledge forward. Um, I'd also like to just spend a few moments talking about the political context for where we are with dementia research currently. We've obviously seen a very welcome increase in political interest in dementia, but I have a slight fear that politicians um as they are are hugely committed to to trying to move you know things forward but if we don't have successes um then that interest may wane and in fact i think we may be to use a a, a british expression making a rod for our own back by having over ambitious claims about what we can achieve by 2020 or by 2025 we could be, in a sense, setting ourselves up for a failure. Uh, fourth point uh, I'd like to sort of, you know, discuss is where we are in terms of the research environment. If one looks globally at the types of research that are that are taking place, I'd like to argue there might be a slight shift of focus away from where we are now in terms of our research spend, in terms of our um in terms of our commitments to taking on a much more um um a much greater emphasis on research which looks at risk factor modification diagnostics uh, and therapeutics therein um, and again I'll, I'll spend a few moments talking about that and of course to bring this all back to the patient if you like or the person at risk of dementia i also think we have to have a weather eye to what the future will look like in terms of clinical practice um, and I do think that we'll, we, we, to what extent we can actually guide this or to what extent we react to it, I think there will be a, a more bimodal distribution of, of practice at the one end of the spectrum around the prevention work and the risk modeling that we're going to be doing. We'll have information that will, that will help empower primary care and public health uh, colleagues to really make a difference in maybe that early primary or early secondary prevention. But at the other end of the spectrum, I think we're going to find a huge, uh, huge amount of resource being 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 allocated towards very intensive and biological assessment of people in this brain health clinic model, which we see for the future. Um, and hopefully, and I say hopefully, 
uh, a lot of resources will be moved away from um, you know end of life care and uh, and people living with dementia because if we're successful there'll be fewer people living with dementia and having re requiring end of life care over the next you know decade or so so that has to be seen as a, as a positive move forward so first off dementia will soon be extinct now uh, you know the analogy of course when you think about extinction you think about dinosaurs there was a there was a there was a mass event if you like uh, that, that that led we believe to the, the extinction of the dinosaurs but i don't think to be fair that what we're going to see in terms of this term dementia losing favor or losing currency is going to be a single moment a single event which will which will see as extension i think much more is going to be much more evolutionary whereby the knowledge that we're gaining around um what is neurodegenerative disease is how the interplay with um with the clinical phenotype are going to recognize that dementia is probably a somewhat um, outdated term i mean if, if we all remember dementia is defined by icd-10 or dsm-5 as being a cognitive impairment which has to have memory impairment that has a functional impact and that definition doesn't require any biological assessment it necessarily defines a group of individuals um, who have very severe cognitive impairment which um, has a as a as a as an impact on function and that degree of cognitive impairment that degree of functional impairment isn't well defined so it's a very loose concept let alone a concept that only defines a part of a disease process right at its tail end. And this is where I think we've really tried hard to convey through terms like prodromal or preclinical or malcognitive impairment, the possibility that the diseases that lead to dementia probably have their genesis in, 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 in midlife, if not earlier. For many of us in the research world, that's now widely accepted. But when we step out of our research world and talk to people in the community, talk to the public, talk to even other clinicians, they find that concept either quite challenging or actually, you know, um, you know, fight against it, to be honest, because there's lots of legacy issues about how we provide clinical services and how we conceptualize dementia. What I'll also spend a little bit of time discussing is how this clinical diagnosis of dementia, because it's somewhat divorced from the biological processes, it 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 doesn't it doesn't help us from an etiological or from a therapeutics perspective to recognize that there are a multiplicity of pathological processes which should and could lead to better personalization or stratification of, of intervention. And it's not just about treating the biology, it's also trying to understand what is it that has led to that individual having those biological processes? What is the interplay between risk factors, both fixed risk factors like genetics and modifiable risk factors, which may be more environmental, to generate these diseases in the first instance? And there's a very complex interplay which we have to accept and accommodate in our models between not just risks and, and, and environmental factors, but also what, the, what is the influence of comorbidities, you know, physical comorbidities as they accumulate uh, through life. So I'm not going to ask people to do a straw poll. People who've heard me talk before may, may recognize this, but often when I present um, these concepts in, in, in a more sort of public arena, I ask people to vote about who they think in these four pictures is most likely to have Alzheimer's dementia. And quite rightly, most people will hold their hands up in the audience for, you know, for B, for, for, for D, apologies. And that's the older person, um, you know, probably over the age of, of 65. But then when you change the title of the slide and you say, well, who in the audience, uh, who, who do you think from the audience has, is most likely to have the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease? And over the last couple of years, thankfully, I've seen more people hold their hands up for B and C than they do for D. Because this is what we're really premised on, in fact, in EPAD, is the disease, the, the Alzheimer's disease process, predates the onset of dementia, which is an endpoint clinical syndrome and the endpoint of quite a long, multi-decade uh, disease process. And what we also, I think, hold on to, 
conceptually, uh, if not empirically yet, is the prospect that earlier in the course of disease, Alzheimer's disease being the example here, the pathological processes are probably slightly more specific, okay? Because as you get, and I don't have to go through this slide in any detail with this audience, because we all know about amyloid and tau, but if we go hypothetically, we could, we could, we could propose that in the early stages of disease, Alzheimer's disease, there are probably fewer pathological processes because these cascades that we talk about haven't yet initiated. But when we go to the person with Alzheimer's dementia, and this is what really makes it difficult for us, both the specific therapeutics, but also in terms of our disease modeling, we know from biochemical and pathological uh, research there are multiple disease processes, not just the amyloid and the tau, but there's also now cerebrovascular disease. You might have um, co-occurrence of problems with alpha synuclein, which is more characteristic, of course, of Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease, the blood-brain barrier integrity problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And trying to put this into a sort of singular sort of cartoon, if you like, down the left-hand panel, amyloid beta, cortisol metabolism, inflammation, vascular changes, tau, etc. We can map out, or could we map out, the changes in those disease processes? Of course, we're heavily reliant on biomarkers to do this over the life course to see what are the secular changes, what is the interplay between these different disease processes in people who ultimately go on to develop one of these clinical conditions. So this might be the profile if we were able to measure it in, 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 a, in, a, in a large number of people. And people who, if you like, if up to the age of 90, age normally, whatever that means, but they don't develop a dementia syndrome. And we know, for instance, just looking at this slide and from, from, from data and ABLE and ADNI, there are a very strong, very high number of people who so-called age normally, but are amyloid positive. Now, this might well be explained by the fact that you need these other pathological processes to either be triggering or to, to interplay to develop a clinical phenotype. So if I flip to now a profile for Alzheimer's disease, which then leads to dementia, one could hypothesize that those disease processes, which are, 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 are indolent, if you like, in, in, in normal aging, are now have a clinical, uh, clinical manifestation because there's more of them, but there's also, there's more of that pathological process, but they're also interacting with other pathologies. So for instance, the person with Alzheimer's disease, you're now seeing problems with tau, you're now seeing problems with vascular uh, changes, you're now seeing problems with inflammation. One of the problems, of course, that we faced in the last 10 or 20 years is as we've been developing therapeutics to try and modify the course of disease, we've really struggled uh, to find any successes. And one of the reasons being, and I think one of the key reasons being is, we use very specific uh, targeted strategies against one pathology in a multi-pathology condition, certainly in the people with probably MCI and probably dementia syndromes. So if you turn off the amyloid beta, you're doing nothing probably at that late stage of, of, of brain failure to the problems with tau, the problems with the cerebrovascular structures, et cetera. So, you know, when I uh, shared this sort of slide in this conversation with my 14 year old daughter a couple of years ago, I said to her, you know, what's, what's the answer? You know, she said something which, you know, many chief executives of drug companies have taken a while to, to come to, and that is you've got to go in earlier and you've got to go in against multiple pathologies. And this is exactly, in some ways, the premise upon which EPAD has been based, is to say, well, look, if you do go in earlier, you throw up a whole bunch of challenges. How do you find those individuals who are early, number one? And number two, how do you know the drugs work? What does work mean? Is there a change in the biomarker? Is there a change in the clinical status? Is there a change in a cognitive outcome measure? And it's probably all of those things. So when we, meant, when we moved earlier, we created for ourselves a whole series of other problems which we had to solve around outcomes, around selection, what have you. So if you like in Alzheimer's disease, this is my whole argument about disease before dementia, you've got more specific pathology present. We have to be heavily reliant on biomarkers. These individuals may be asymptomatic, uh, philosophical discussion about what asymptomatic means. They're not presenting to a clinician with symptoms, but when we 
assess them. They may well have cognitive impairment, but they're not presenting, so it's not symptomatic. But also critically, hypothetically, we believe that this will be a much more modifiable stage of the disease and all other branches of medicine. You get in early, whether it be an infection or a malignancy or whatever it may be, you, ex you expect the prognosis to be improved. If you juxtaposition that with Alzheimer's dementia, I hope I've argued you have multiple pathologies present. You don't probably need the biomarker so much to make a clinical diagnosis. The diagnosis is now based on symptoms and function. And in those individuals, you want to get you derive much greater benefit from now symptomatic treatments. So how do we get there? This is a, the, the, the goal. Um, we have to recognize this complexity of interplay between risk factors, both fixed and modifiable, and the life core. So all this slide is, is trying to illustrate is I'm not gonna drill down on each of these individual risk factors, what have you. It's just to make sure that when we're doing our modeling work, we recognize the complexity, not only of uh, various different risk factors, but also they may have different impacts at different stages in the life course. The toxicity of a risk factor may be greater in midlife than it is in late life, for instance. The other critical thing about this slide is none of these risk factors for the epidemiologists and statisticians amongst us are particularly strong risk factors, maybe apart from APOE4 homozygosity. The rest of these, when we look through the evidence base, odd ratios, 1.5 to 2.5, these are not really strong associations. So we know that this, they must not, they cannot be working in isolation of other potential risks and, and, and other factors, including protective factors. So what we've talked about in EPAD, and this is now hope, hopefully becoming currency elsewhere, is, is what we've described, and we have some papers that we're preparing on this about four-factor modeling. We will be able to capture at scale in great depth and accuracy risk factors, top left panel. These are genetic risks as well as environmental and clinical risks. At the same time, we will be able to capture the expression of the disease itself in that individual. And we measure the expression of disease in two ways. Number one, biologically through biomarkers. And number two, through how the person reacts to that disease in things like function, cognition, neuropsychiatric symptoms, etc. The critical fourth factor, or the fourth dimension, if you like, is time. Because cross-sectional data is only so revealing. It's how these, ch these factors change over time which will help us to predict the future. And the vision I think that we have is although all these minions may look rather similar at first glance, they all have their own individual uh, trajectories through their life course. And in this case, we're talking about trajectories of neurodegenerative disease. And with this data, with this information at our fingertips and the models, the, 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 the computational models we will develop, we would hope that any given individual from birth onwards can be given an accurate probability of a neurodegenerative event. Now, that event might be dementia. That event might be a 10% decline in cognition around you know, the R-band score, or it might be a 10% increase in hippocampal or decrease in hippocampal volume. Now, hopefully, these models for different outcomes will all sit on top of each other, which would be really reassuring. And as age, is one of the probably the strongest risk factor that just adds into our model about what the future will hold so what will this look like in the in the future the three steps to achieving secondary prevention are number one risk factors both fixed and modifiable being measured accurately cognitive profile biomarker evidence and changes in these giving all this fantastic information and data to our you know, you know, incredible statisticians and mathematicians who've got access to really powerful computers. And hopefully over time, we will do, be able to develop these algorithms, these scores, call it what you may, they will be able to then be translated into clinical practice where we can give people a good, a good estimate of the risk. The other thing that we would want to then be able to do is say, well, for that individual, 
what is the what is the mechanism by which we affect that probability of something happening in the future? Is it by reducing modifiable risk factors? Is it by enhancing resilience? Or is it, and it complements those two approaches, giving specific intervention or interventions? We also need to be able to, both in research practice, but also in clinical practice, know that our intervention has worked. And I think this is where we have another challenge about surrogacy. Is a biomarker normalizing as showing, for instance, clear, clearing amyloid in a 50-year-old who had a high SUVR sufficient to give you confidence that over time that individual is less likely to develop dementia? Okay. So in terms of this tailoring prevention, like I said, We've got the risks, we've got the, the cognition and the biomarkers and the, core, and the change of course over time giving us that risk model. But what's critically important, critically important is making sure we understand for every single given individual what's driving their probability of something happening in the future, okay? So let me just illustrate this with a kind of a, 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 you know, a cartoon here. If we start off on the left-hand side, in this brilliant future, we may be able to say to a 60-year-old who comes into one of our clinics or has, you know, into the primary care setting or whatever it may be, uh, from our models, when we enter your data into the machine, it tells us you have a 73% risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia in the next 10 years. But we also know that that risk, the components that lead to that risk are a certain proportion from lifestyle, a certain proportion from genetic, a certain proportion because this individual is diabetic, and a certain proportion of that model is because they've already got some amyloid in their brain, for instance, okay? So the advice then to this 60-year-old is actually not to go on an anti-amyloid therapy, it's to say, well, look, you, we can reduce your risk or you can reduce your own risk if you manage your diabetes better, and you lose a whole bunch of weight because for you it was being obese and diabetic which was driving a lot of that risk they come back 10 years later they have improved their lifestyle they've lost weight the diabetes is brilliantly controlled you'll notice the biology has maybe increased a little bit but they've actually reduced their overall risk and you've, you've incorporated age in this 10-year risk as well you then say to them actually look, we've probably gone as far as we can go with your lifestyle and your diabetes you just notice your amyloid's increasing a little bit. So maybe we should put you on anti-amyloid therapy at this stage. And lo and behold, in this individual, you've then reduced their risk down again because you've managed to, 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 to manage that biology. The lifestyle's still good. We've never touched the genetics. Diabetes have maybe gone off a little bit as they get older. But lo and behold, this 80-year-old's 10-year risk of developing dementia is now 40%. So you've probably prevented it in some regards. And this is what we, I think I'd like to be doing in, in five, 10 years time, but I need the data to drive these decisions. Good news is when we talk about prevention is we're probably achieving it already. And I'm just gonna show you two very quick papers. And obviously people on this call were involved in some of these. CFAS, 10 years apart, looking at the incidence rate of dementia in men and women, same sample frame, same protocols. And lo and behold, in men, between those two, these two sort of waves of recruitment, there seemed to be a substantial reduction in the incidence. That's a top right uh, figure. The incidence of dementia um, per thousand person years in men uh, in each age band. In women, not so much. The interpretation of this was that this cohort effect of people with better cardiovascular um, management of their, you know, be it statins or hypertension or whatever it may be, was having a net effect on reducing the rate of dementia because you were actually at a population level in these, you know, over the, the, the time course in the, in, the, in the early 21st century, you were beginning to see better cardiovascular health, better cerebrovascular health, and there in a reduction in the incidence of dementia. The other bit of huge encouraging news, of course, and this is, you know, from, you know, colleagues of ours within the EPAD world, Mia and, and, and Lena in particular, um, was how multimodal interventions are having a, a beneficial effect in people at a high risk of developing dementia. So we're getting some wins, some real success stories that 
let's look and see how we take this early evidence forward and see can we develop it for um, more purposefully in some ways to prevent dementia uh, in the near future. Okay. Shifting gear a little bit, what we have, the reality of our situation now is we've had no new drug therapies for Alzheimer's disease and certainly none that are disease modifying ever and only symptomatic agents in the last sort of 10, 15 years. And again, seen all these slides, we know the scale of the problem, we know this and through lack of effort in terms of the number of drugs that are being trialed. But we've got to ask ourselves, well, why is it that these trials aren't working? And I think I explained earlier, I think it's simply because certainly for disease modifying drugs, we're simply going in way too late. Now, obviously, you know, a few weeks ago, maybe a week or two ago, um, we had another company um, who decided um, that they were going to shut down their 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 Alzheimer's, their neurogenic, their neuroscience research program. Um, and many on this call are probably from a psychology background or a clinical background, and they they know they know about learned helplessness. And I can't I keep coming back to this this concept that when you keep going back and doing the same thing over and over again, but you get no reward, you become helpless. And I just love this little cartoon, which was, you know, the character on the left, I want to go and claim, climb that green tree. I want to go and, 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 and develop a disease modifying drug for Alzheimer's dementia. Colleague said, cool, you should. He said he can't because they've just failed so many times they can't do it. So why don't you try another tree? He says, because I should try the green one. And I think what we have to do is try and encourage people to maybe think about other opportunities, maybe think about other ways of approaching the concept of Alzheimer's dementia, to think beyond the green tree, if you like, because the helpless situation is you keep doing the same thing ad infinitum over and over again, and you get no reward, you get nothing back, and you become depressed, or in a clinical sense, you become withdrawn. And what companies are doing is they are withdrawing. So we need to be bold enough to go after the orange or the blue tree. You know, we have to be able to provide evidence, we have to provide support, we have to be able to provide encouragement that we have to move away from what was making us feel helpless. Um, and actually, dare I say it, work with this evolution in science, but maybe, and this is something again that we'll come back to later, we have to parcel it as a revolution. I think personally that a lot of the work that we're doing or have been doing over the last 10 to 15 years around better disease models, be the ADNI data, the ABLE data, whatever it is, hasn't been revol it has been revolutionary, but it's been seen as evolutionary. And I think this is where we have a challenge and this is something I think uh, we have to show leadership on in the near future. So, viva la evolution. Right, so the next the next thing, so this was that first part was probably the longest part, and that was the disease before dementia piece. Um, and getting rid of this, or not getting rid of, but challenging this whole concept we have about, you know, should we still consider using terms like dementia or MCI in the future? Um, the next few sections will be a little bit quicker. Um, research will be dominated by major initiatives with huge gravitational pull, okay? And we're seeing this already. now. Thankfully, all of us are involved in one of those huge projects, EPAD. Um, and what we, what I think will happen, and I've got no particular insights into this, it's just my you know, perspective on the things I see around about me, is that smaller projects will circle around these major initiatives but never really be part of them and have very little influence on their activity. So I'm a little bit, being a little bit Newtonian here that you'll have these major projects where they'll have a huge gravitational field and they'll have they'll be the real, to kill the analogy, the real shining lights that most people will see and reflect on. There will be other research activity taking place globally, but there'll be small projects in slightly more isolated environments with you know smaller budgets and yes, they'll still publish, but they won't, they won't be influencing the main direction of travel to the extent of the, of the larger the larger projects. 
Now, I can decide if that's a good thing or not. There's part of me thinks it's a fantastic thing because I'm, I'm fortunate enough and privileged enough to be part of one of those major projects. But is that the best way to do science? Is the best way to do science to sort of invest in the major projects, which have their own attitudes and legacies and influences by dominant PIs or whatever it may be? Or is it better to have the more kind of blue sky approach whereby you, you, you evolve the science by making mistakes at a smaller level? I don't know. I do sometimes advocate quite strongly that, that if we have a key challenge in front of us, like can we prevent Alzheimer's dementia or can we you know, improve the course of Alzheimer's disease, we need a NASA. We need a, an, uh, we need a, an operational environment that ultimately coordinated getting a man on the moon, okay? Prior to the establishment of NASA, you had multiple agencies and organizations and research groups in various countries working in a very discoordinated way to build a rocket, to build a spaceship, to build a space suit. And it was only when you came up with a better coordination that you addressed that key, um, that key human challenge. And this is just a sort of a snapshot of some of, if you like, what these major projects are. Um, and I've obviously got a very UK-centric view of the universe, but you know we've just established, for instance, and I don't think we've even got, yes, I do, the Dementia Research Institute, quarter of a billion pounds of investment from the Medical Research Council, from Alzheimer's Research UK, from Alzheimer's Society, we've got DZNE, apologies, that's not on the slide here in, in, in Germany. We've got EPAD, we've got Dementia Platform UK. There's a lot of these, these projects which are defined probably by each of them having you know almost eight figure or nine figure um you know uh, investments and, and grants but the critical thing i think in is not only do you try and coordinate smaller satellite projects to these but can you also coordinate all of these and this is something that that challenges us a lot uh, within the EPAD sort of executive and, and the like. Um, you know, we have our place in history probably set out for us in some ways within EPAD because this was a fantastic poster that came out of the Alts Forum um, uh, group and it's presented in, in Toronto at the AIC. And it highlights, and I know this is a bit blurry and I don't expect everyone to read everything, but it highlights all the major achievements in Alzheimer's disease research over the years. And if you turn your attention to the far right-hand corner, you can see EPAD in there. Now, we've not delivered anything in substantial as yet, but I think there's a recognition by history, by our current, by our peer group, by our, by our audience, that we've got massive potential. Uh, and that's why we're at the right-hand side uh, of, this, of, this, of this chart. So, you know, again, the EPAD fellows, the leadership, uh, have a great responsibility to deliver on some of the objectives of the project. Okay. So I'm just gonna, I know everyone here is on EPAD and I'm not gonna spend half an hour talking about it. We all know what it's about, but I just wanted to maybe just finish off the conversation about disease before dementia to just again, sort of tether us to what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis with an EPAD. To address those issues about disease models, we had to do five things. We needed to find huge numbers of participants, thousands upon thousands of people who are gonna give us the highest quality data around the biology of the disease that are based on what we know and believe to be the bi biology as it stands. So we're making sure we're capturing tau, amyloid, inflammation, genetics, uh, cortisol levels, HPA axis dysfunction they're in. You know, it was only by having all that data that we minimize the risk in our models of, of unknown or residual confound, unknown confounding. And then we have to work with, dare I say it, revolutionary statisticians who are willing to embrace new ways of looking at data. You know, we will see chi-squares, we will see t-tests over the next few months in the EPAD, but ultimately, those frequentist approaches to disease modeling 
our soul last century. We have to move on and get better understanding this disease from a whole brain uh, level, using all the data available to us, not just testing singular hypotheses. And one of the things that we know is that these are going to be difficult and challenging times for us as an academic community, but also in, in how we share this information with the with the, with uh, the people that matters to most, the public, the people at risk of dementia. As we move from this concept of dementia, which people are just beginning to get comfortable with, and say, "Well, actually, you know, disease probably starts in midlife," you have to make sure that you have um, really good, professional, informed, and reactive. Uh, communication strategies and that's why as you know with an epad we have the excellent work of work package six led by alzheimer europe so that's epad in a nutshell that's what we're doing now these are all the partners again you know all this already you're part of the you're part of the family um, but it just illustrates the complexity and the extent of the partnership in terms of private industry as uh, patient organizations, SMEs, and also, you know, leading academic groups or institutions from across Europe. I don't show this to, to remind you about EPAD, I just show you this because even if we're talking about coordinating the moonshot, the prevention of dementia between projects, it's a staggering task to even do coordination within project, <laughs> you know, and this slide is almost deliberately complicated. There are so many multiple elements required. And I know we've got a, a, a webinar in the future about you know simply this, and people should not underestimate the challenges in bringing together a project of this extent with so many partners and so many viewpoints, uh, all of which are, 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 are almost um, you know, are consistently uh, excellent. Okay. Let me move to politicians. Um, now, maybe a slightly provocative um, you know, title to the slide, politicians will be getting bored as, uh, as the prospect that their hyperbole could not be matched by reality. You know, and you know, this is this is divides opinion. You know, is it a good thing um, that people like David Cameron, uh, Cameron, Sarkozy, Obama, and that's the Glasgow Declaration, by the way, at the bottom there. Is it a good thing that we have mission statements or we have we have visions to you know cure dementia by 20 alzheimer's dementia by 2025 or whatever year it is this year it's i i do fear a little bit like the helplessness that we were talking about earlier that if we set our stall our 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 our, our goal too high all that can happen is failure there was a reality in the late 1960s or the mid 1960s of put a about putting a man on the moon. It was, it was seen as tractable and achievable. Otherwise, Kennedy wouldn't have said it. Can you imagine if Kennedy had said, you know, we're going to put a man on Mercury or we're going to put a man on, you know, Venus? And you do wonder about whether or not the information or the advice that these political leaders is receiving is sufficient or accurate enough to not lead them to make comments that are maybe too too overstretching for the field. But there's also a power of politics, and thanks to, to Cindy and Jean-Georges for sharing this slide with me, because through the sort of leadership of Alzheimer Europe, we've seen a massive increase in engagement from politicians in putting together dementia strategies for their countries and regions. Okay. And we anticipate that over the next five years, this map will be completely red uh, because each and every country could and should have a government led or government endorsed strategy for dementia. Now, at the moment, most of those dementia strategies talk about care, they talk, they talk about the lived experience of dementia. I know in Scotland, we're on our fourth strategy now, we've just published our third. And one of the things I'm hoping to be able to achieve in Scotland is to get brain health and prevention much more prominent in the strategy, the fourth strategy, which will be three or four years away. So you can see how politicians and politics can also be a great enabler, um, as well as maybe, you know, in some ways, uh, creating challenges that are too high 
that can only be met by failure. So high goals may be motivating, and that's the, the, the positive sign of this is that you can engage people and the community comes around you, be the public, other politicians, financiers, Bill Gates, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. High goals may be motivating, but do they run the risk of leading to helplessness? Do they run the risk of saying, I'm going to keep climbing the green tree and look, I've fallen off again, I've fallen off again, I've fallen off again. What we should do is say, well, can we can we break this down a little bit? Should we create multiple winnable and incremental goals, which may eventually get us to the same point, but then we get this positive reward. We get positive reinforcement. Hey, you know, we, 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 we said we were going to do this little thing. 2,000 people in the EPAC cohort, get some new disease models out there into the Lancet, get a drug in, get, get a proof of plan. You know, these are the things that maybe rather than saying, let's cure dementia by 2025, we should be having smaller, more achievable goals. And as I've argued before, the revolution should allow us to, to, to climb a different tree. So, almost finished. If you like, this is how I've seen the last 20 years, okay? The gravitational pull in terms of research has been around drug development, okay? We've been very much driven, really since the launch of Denepazil, around developing better therapeutics, okay? And you cannot underestimate for, I don't think there's anybody else as old as I am on this call, but late in the mid 1990s, when we were working in clinical practice, we had no medication specifically for Alzheimer's disease or for dementia. It was a game changer to then be able to give a therapy specifically for the condition that so many people were living with. It became druggable. It created hope. It also catalyzed the existence of memory clinics because at the end of the day, denepazil and the whole range of symptoms that people present with or suffer from in dementia, memory is not actually the one that gives them the most trouble. It's neuropsychiatric symptoms, it's depression, it's, it's apathy, it's agitation, personality change. But yet, we measured the efficacy of this drug against memory because it seemed to move it because of the cholinesterase or cholinergic um, underpinning of the circuit of papes and the and the and the and the, and the, and the memory um, the pathways therein. And interestingly, how we then reconceptualized Alzheimer's dementia as being a memory disorder, and we set up memory clinics and we set up, you know, you have memory drugs. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the whole clinical picture and a totally irrelevant part in front of temporal dementia and possibly a completely irrelevant part in preclinical <laughs> dementia as well. We've become very, we've looked, we've looked at the neurodegenerative disease spectrum through the prism that the episode created, right? So drug development was at the epicenter, if you like, of all this work. And I would also argue that we kind of flipped things a little bit. We said, well, you'll see that I've put diagnosis overlapping with drug development, DEX, shorthand for drug for, for diagnosis, because we tend to then try and diagnose people who are going to respond to a drug treatment. And then what happened was we actually flipped. We actually started to say, well, look, let's do all of our modeling around the drug targets that we believe to be existing. We stopped, we stopped asking the question, you know, what are the disease processes in Alzheimer's disease? Instead, subtle difference, but important difference, what is the role of amyloid in the development of Alzheimer's disease? Why? Because we had anti-amyloid therapies. It's a very different question. And that's why in EPAD, we've tried to accommodate multiple disease processes. We're not asking what the question, we're not, in our disease models, we're not saying, what is the role of amyloid in causing Alzheimer's dementia? We're saying, what causes Alzheimer's dementia? Okay. So in the future, I see a much different research environment. Sure, drug development is going to be a big part of it, but the diagnostics, or if you like, I'm going to have a debate about the difference in diagnostics and prognostics and risk profiling, but that piece will begin to disentangle itself simply from finding people for, ther for drug therapies. And the dominant force, I think, that needs to feed all of this is better understanding of the disease or diseases 
that lead to these clinical conditions. And when we do that, we need to recognize we might need new outcome measures, be they biomarkers or clinical or cognitive outcome measures. And we also have to spend a lot more time understanding the interplay between risk factors and these models, right? And I also think that some of the best successes we've had to date have been around multimodal prevention studies. And if we can tailor those multimodal prevention studies to an individual risk, we're going to see even greater therapeutic benefit. So over the next five years, I think there'll be a better understanding of disease complexity, or better acceptance, I should say, of disease complexity and, and how they interplay with clinical and biological outcomes. And the disease modeling will drive more targeted therapy in particular combinations. And we're going to find that in that disease modeling work, we're going to find that Alzheimer's dementia is such a redundant concept, like saying we've got a drug for cancer. We're going to stratify and stratify and stratify. Finally, in this piece, in terms of future, we will see the emergence of, not the emergence, but the application of the big data environment using machine learning techniques and always collecting data real time, fast accommodation of new data coming in through our memory clinics, through our, through our other services, constantly remodeling and using, using you know, Bayesian machine learning approaches. Those models are going to get better, better refined. And critically, they're going to, those models are not going to be based in small cohorts of 20,000 people in EPAD. They're going to be based on 2 million people at a population level. So it's critically important in this big data revolution that we collect the right data to help these disease modeling activities at a population level. It's not without its challenges, but I think it's critically important. So how will we be working in the future? Um, I'm gonna slip now to the clinical side of things. This was figure I put together in, in Harold's paper that came out last year. Um, I've talked about tailoring risk factor interventions and advice. We'll have the information. We'll be able to put these personalized prevention plans in place. How will we use drugs for those people who need for break, breakthrough disease? Well, I think it's going to be in this sort of model where you say, well, look, let's, let, let's, let's use a course of a or drug tailored or, or personalized to that individual's biology. So when the biology um, changes, the biomarker changes, you put them in a course, you measure the biomarker outcome, you know, it, it, um, it goes down, you stop the drug, you bring them back, it goes up, blah, 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 in the background of the risk factor modification. And what in doing so you do is you change from that course of illness in the dashed line, the untreated disease course, to ameliorating it. Now, you're not saying you stopped it, but you're certainly pushing it back by 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And the decisions on drug therapy are based exclusively on movement on that target, that mechanistic target for the drug. Now, we brought a lot of people together in Edinburgh uh, last year, actually two years ago now, to really think, well, this is fantastic that we're doing all this research. We anticipate that we're going to have better disease models. We anticipate that at some point we're going to have therapies that are going to be used in preclinical and prodromal populations. It doesn't matter if those therapies are drug therapies or if those drug or if those therapies are um, multimodal, you know, lifestyle interventions. Is the NHS ready with the way it runs memory clinics, with the type of engagement it has with the population, with the types of patients who are being reserved from primary care? And we didn't think that we were ready and we wanted to be ready because we didn't want there to be this delay between an, an innovation or a research output taking place, be it a new biomarker, a new disease um, modifying drug or a new uh, multimodal intervention. And the UK having to wait five years before services turned around to, to pick up. So I just want to finish with talking about the Edinburgh consensus just for a couple of slides, because like I said before, we need to be able to adapt our clinical services to what the advances are going to be. And across Europe, many of the centers where we're working in our trial delivery centers are already ahead of the curve. But I know from speaking to colleagues in Amsterdam and Geneva and Barcelona, 
you'll have to go two miles down the road from those memory clinics or those brain health clinics as they're probably going to be called not too distant future and it's all old school so you know we need to see how can we lead this evolution or revolution in the clinical services that are built upon the research so there's four underpinning observations number one was there was a rapidly developing understanding of Alzheimer's disease in the phase before dementia develops and it's heavily reliant on biomarkers we need to have services that can do biomarkers Number two, although we've seen these failures with programs like EPAD or, or, or other initiatives, we will see um, better therapies for smaller subpopulations of people uh, based on these biomarkers as I've described already. Despite that, even if there's no therapies, I know, and I'm sure many of the clinicians on this call know, that people are still coming up to the clinic and saying, what's wrong with me? And I think people have a right to know. Now, there might not be no, any therapy for it, but you certainly wouldn't go with a, with a lump or a bump to an oncology clinic and the oncologist saying, well, I could find out what this is, but there's no treatment, so I'm not going to bother investigating you. That's what we do now in our memory clinics. We somehow say, well, there's no therapy, so what's the point of knowing? These people, I'm not saying we should screen the population, and not, but if they're inviting, if they're bringing themselves up saying, doctor, What's wrong with me? I think as clinicians, we've got a responsibility to do all that we can to answer that question. And the fourth point is when we scoped out or we look around what's going on, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in most other parts of Europe, there's an urgent need to shift from these diagnostic memory clinic based approaches to, and I'm paraphrasing Giovanni here, to brain health clinics, which are more engaged in risk profiling rather than Nestle Diagnostics. So I'll just quickly flip through this. These are, again, the, the, these are the four domains that we are going to be operationalizing over the next year or two with as many stakeholders as possible. Um, we need to find a way that um, we can do these biomarkers for personalizing the intervention. We also need to be cognizant to the fact that when a disease-modifying drug is launched, it's highly likely that organizations like NICE are going, to, are going to demand a very good phase four environment or at least trials. And if we can create that, remember that big data environment I talked about earlier about how we're capturing data at scale and consistently and with great uh, accuracy, then that's a phase four environment. So we can do these phase four trials without actually doing a protocol almost because we can just look at our, our routinely collected data. Equity of access is key. Uh, clearly, it might be that these clinics set up originally around university hospitals, but we have to make sure that in around that, there's no there's no discrimination on age, gender, uh, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this just has to go into how we develop our service lines. We also have to recognize that you know, I'm a psychiatrist, there'll be neurologists, there'll be OT, there'll be speech and language therapy. These are going to be truly multidisciplinary groups, multi-professional groups. Uh, the bottom right is unfortunately not the plans for my brain health clinic, uh, but you can see how this might change. It might be that we're looking at a younger population who've got different needs, who've got different requirements. So the environment in which they're assessed has to reflect that patient population. There's some outstanding things that we have to work through about who should be referred, how the services react to those referrals. Do we have a primary, secondary, tertiary model, for instance? We also have to think hard about how many people would be eligible. We think it's probably just tens of thousands in the UK, not hundreds of thousands, certainly not millions, because of the stratification that's going to take place to find out who's going to benefit most from these drugs. And the fourth part that we really want to talk about is communication. And for the consensus itself, we were hosted by Alzheimer's Scotland, but we also had contributions from ARUK and the Alzheimer's Society, because we need to bring people with us. When we published this consensus a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I have received quite a lot of challenging emails from people, colleagues mainly, who are really almost angry about what we were, what we were um, uh, proposing because it, it really is disruptive. It might not seem like it to us inside our world in EPAD because we've kind of got this two, three, four years ago, but there's a lot of people who are really quite comfortable and really support the current way of doing things and it's going to be a challenge 
to bring those people, or actually, let's say, sorry again, it'll be a challenge to incorporate their views to make sure as we go forward, we really do represent, you know, a, a wide um, constituency. But we also need leadership. What we can do is dilute this to the point that we don't actually see any progress. So I mentioned bimodal distribution, and I think if you like, this is my last little sort of suite of slides now, bimodal distribution. At the moment, or maybe it was a few years ago, all of our research and all of our clinical practice was in the MCI dementia phase of neurodegenerative disease, and that reflected where our practice was. And our practice has been creeping back into people earlier and earlier in the course of the disease. So if you like, 2015, a couple of years ago, we're beginning to see a huge growth in the amount of research taking place in preclinical prodromal disease. Does this require major projects with huge gravitational pull or lots of little projects? We can discuss that. And we're seeing practice, maybe driven by statements like, you know, in the in the UK's dementia strategy or the English dementia strategy of five, six years ago, they talked about early diagnosis. And what that meant was a lot of people were coming up to clinic with MMSEs of 30. We then have subjective cognitive disorder. We then have early preclinic, early prodro, early MCI, et cetera. So you can see how we're struggling with our old concepts to accommodate this new group of people coming forward asking what's wrong with their brain. In two or three years, we might find if we get these brain health clinics really working out nicely, that we do actually have and deliberately target people who are asymptomatic and preclinical. Now, I have no idea how we're going to find these people because people can't come up to your clinic and say, doctor, I've got amyloid in my brain. They need to have gone through some sort of you know, assessment, cognitive assessment, or whatever it may be, even blood-based test, maybe in 2025, that'll say they're at high risk and worthy of further investigation. But the research is going back in that direction too. So by 2025, I, oops, by 2025, I see research and practice really disappearing, even if we still use the term dementia, at those late stages of neurodegenerative disease, simply because there will not be so many people who will have that condition. Not so many people nowadays um, have, you know, present with, you know, stage four breast cancer. Our services are all around the, the left-hand side of the curve about finding people at the earliest stages and managing them with surgery and radiotherapy and chemotherapy so they don't get to that stage four. And I think that's a good paradigm that we should be using in our field. So just to finish, one thing that I haven't mentioned through the course of this, but one thing which I think must underpin all of our work, and everyone's seen this slide a million times before, but what this slide reminds me is that the biggest increase in incidence of neurogenic diseases, and if you like dementia, is gonna be in low and middle income countries. And if we're gonna coordinate all these major research activities around disease models, around therapeutics, around multimodal interventions. To truly have an impact at a global level, we have to be cognizant that when we do PET amyloid or we do CSFA beta levels, we need to be able to translate that to be used at a global scale. And if that means doing blood tests, salivary tests, urine tests, cognitive tests that approximate to these things, this is a major piece of work that EPAD currently isn't involved with, but could and should be in the future. If people were to say, we want to look at using a blood-based biomarker assay to validate or to look at the, 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 the area under the curve relative to PET amyloid, we should be able to accommodate somehow that research, if not directly in our cohort, at least, at least uh, support it elsewhere. Because I would be horrified if by the end of this project, we have created therapies and diagnostics that only apply to those fortunate enough to live in, in, in Europe, the US, Japan, or, or, or Australia, and have not been able to accommodate uh, the millions, if not billions of people in low, currently low and middle income countries. So summary, maybe by 2020, dementia will no longer exist as a term that we use, and I think we, might disappear of its own right or it might need a little bit of a push but I think I 
could argue till the cows come home why I think it's maybe, maybe time for us to move our move our language forward to reflect more what's actually happening um, in the brain uh, of people with neurogenic disease. Secondly, there will be several key major global projects which are hopefully going to be well integrated both internally uh, but also coordinated externally. Uh, how we achieve that, there are initiatives in place to try and do that. And it's something that, dare I say, leaders of other projects like GAP and, and, and ADNI and Diane, I think we're all on the same page and we all recognise we would get more uh, if we could make two and two equal five. Um, thirdly, I think they will be better informed and lowered political expectation. I, 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 I do worry, uh, if I do worry about one thing, I worry that if we don't lower the expectation politically over the next year or two, and also maybe lower the expectation within pharmaceutical companies, we're actually going to just continue to see failure and we may actually be disappointing the politicians to the extent that they take their energy and their enthusiasm elsewhere. Have we got a time in the sun? Have we got a period, a window of opportunity in Alzheimer's disease research? Possibly. That window won't be open forever. And I think we need to be cognizant of that and give the public, the politicians, stakeholders, some, some, some success stories pretty quickly. Drug development is going to remain a key part of the research solar system, if you like. But I actually think the main emphasis, the sun in the middle of the solar system, the epicenter is actually going to be around disease modeling. I don't think until we really understand this disease in much more detail will we be able to make informed and correct decisions, not just on the targets, but also in the way we measure the impact of those targets on disease, be it through cognitive or biomarker outcomes. And I think clinical services must overcome the inertia, which is inherent. I think a lot of clinical services for dementia, and I can say as a psychiatrist, um, are based in, uh, on a mental health model. And they're not really accommodating of accepting the rapidity of innovation that's going to take place within the Alzheimer's field. We're not dynamic. We're not flight footed. Um, and I think that's something we have to address at a, at a, at a clinical uh, and maybe also political level. You guys are going to be absolutely pivotal in crafting this future. Um, you know, when we finish this project, well, when we transition to the next phase of EPAD in 2020, a lot of the doctoral students on the call and the postdoctoral students on the call will soon be coming the leaders, the PIs that will take the baton from the current leadership. So this is another reason why with an EPAD project, we've been so completely determined and focused on the academy uh, because you are, of course, the leaders of the future. So on that point, good luck. And we all wish you well, Ipadistas. Thank you very much.